Hey folks, it's Brian. I'm here at BTC, the blockchain training conference. I'm sitting here with a pretty prominent member of the Bitcoin and blockchain community, Andreas Antonopoulos. Hey, Thank you very much. Very good much. to meet you, Brian. Great to meet you as well. Um, Andreas, you've done quite a bit in the space. Uh, you've written a book, you're a very popular speaker, you've taught courses at a university, um, consulted for various startups. Um, tell me a little bit uh, in terms of how you first got into Bitcoin and blockchain, and you know what you the progression that you've seen uh, up until today, since you have such a kind of high bird's eye view of everything that's going on. Um, I got into the space in the beginning of 2012. Um, I'd ignored Bitcoin a couple of times before that. Uh, kind of dismissed it as gambling money or silly internet money, geek nerd money. Um, I read the paper. Uh, December of 2011 and it changed my perspective. I realized that there was a lot more depth to this and in January 2012 I dropped all of my other professional associations and projects and devoted myself full-time to Bitcoin and nothing else and started working full-time in the space. Didn't actually get paid uh, for a very long time. <laughs> so it was a bit of a jump into the wild, you know, into the unknown. Um, and you know, really focused on um, education, on uh, trying to use um, some of my skills at explaining things and uh, talking about Bitcoin and helping people understand what it is, how it works, what implications it has, and putting it in context, in a broader context. In uh, 2013, I started writing the book Mastering Bitcoin. It was published um, at the end of 2014. Um, and uh, it's now been translated into 14 languages. Uh, it's available under an open source license. Anyone can download it to read it for free. Uh, or, of course, they can also buy it on Amazon if they want, which is great. Um, and I've been teaching in the space. You know, the, the space has developed uh, dramatically. Um, and in many ways, it's changed. I think in the early days you had uh, a core of highly committed, ideologically focused people who embraced this, um, who really took to Bitcoin um, because of specific ideology, like really focused on um, private money, on money without intermediaries, without banks and governments. Um, and looked to Bitcoin as a tool to create a, a new power structure, if you like, or to change power structures. Now, as the technology has become more mainstream, uh, so has the audience, so have the influences. And we've seen a, a rush of investment into the space. Uh, and in many cases, it's not ideological investment. Uh, it's predicated purely on profit motives, which isn't a bad thing. It's investing in, an, in the space. Um, ironically, we now have the banks singing our tune. Um, we went from uh, essentially being ridiculed uh, as a space to uh, this compromise position where they're trying to cherry pick the things that they're comfortable with, the blockchain instead of Bitcoin. Um, 2015, I think, was the year of Bitcoin is bad, blockchain is good. Uh, now we come full circle and Bitcoin is the new blockchain and people are beginning to figure out that, oh, you know what, maybe Bitcoin is where all of the really serious blockchain activity is actually happening. Um, and now we've got the banks singing our tune, which is funny. Um, and we've seen kind of a shift in, in perception. Uh, we went through a period where there was a lot of negative propaganda and perception. Uh, at first kind of dismissing it as a pyramid scheme or an investment scheme, missing the technology and the uniqueness of it. And then um, gradually going into kind of more negative coverage about, oh, it's going to be used by um, criminals and this, that, and the other. And, and now a, a realization that it is in fact a platform. And this platform can be used for any purpose. Um, and you know, it's my firm belief that as you broaden the applicability of this technology, you broaden the audience that uh, get participates in this technology, and it becomes mainstream. It becomes mainstream in its culture. It becomes mainstream in its values. It becomes mainstream in its motives. Um, and what what are mainstream values and motives? 
um, feeding your family, shelter, healthcare, education, sanitation, uh, you know, the, the fundamental um, values of, of family and society get reflected. Just like the internet at first was uh, full of uh, weirdos and geeks and uh, in many cases scam artists and things like that, and now it's full of cat videos. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I do find it interesting. Uh, the conversation has definitely changed. And yes. I mean, I, I, I first caught, caught wind of Bitcoin time, sometime after 2012, um, 2013, 2014. And even then till now, I've noticed the conversation drastically changed. So I can't imagine what it was like if, you're, if you were in Bitcoin, let's say in 2010 or the one that came afterwards, where it started off with, type of, with your early adopters, your anarchists, your type of libertarians, the people who are kind of against the state. Um, and now you have outside banks, consultants, major accounting firms interested in the, the idea of this Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, but we've yet to see this idea of a killer app, this amazing technology where there is this one or two subset of applications that can kind of blanket everything and across the world. What is your opinion of a killer app? Is it something that's going to come out? Is it something that's already in the works? What is your thoughts of a major application that will take this technology and bring it to the next level? I think we already have a killer app. I think we have a couple of killer apps. Uh, it's difficult to recognize them as such because in many of the circles where we discuss Bitcoin, we have the privilege of, uh, of uh, banking that is very easy to use, inexpensive, um, that allows us multi-currency use. But um, you know, the, the bottom line is that um, the, the killer app has already emerged. The killer app is borderless, open, censorship-resistant currency and payments that cannot be interfered with, that are open to anyone in the world, that do not require a background check, a credit check, or the provision of identity, that can be used on any phone, and that can send money near instantaneously and for very low or no fees anywhere in the world. That is a killer app. Payments are a $1.7 trillion uh, a year uh, economy, right? And so you don't need much more, but there is more. Um, the other killer app that we see again and again is immutability. Uh, Bitcoin is the immutable ledger. Uh, it's the one that provides immutability on a global scale, on a planetary scale, um, with the underwriting of a very large investment in energy. Uh, but that very large investment in energy through mining actually provides a very strong thermodynamic guarantee of immutability. It's redefined the very word immutability. Mm -hmm. When you have terawatt hour immutability in Bitcoin, um, pretty much any other form of immutability isn't. <laughs> uh, it isn't immutable anymore because immutability is defined as the upper range of how hard it is to change something. So. Um, you know, I think that's a killer app. You know, the, the ability to have something that is unchanging, um, and that over time becomes more and more immutable and more and more strong, plus payments. That's all the killer app we need to go mainstream. The need is enormous. There are billions of people who are unbanked. There are billions more who are underbanked. There are billions more who have um, use of just one currency, uh, live in countries where the governments and the banks are thoroughly corrupt and where monetary crises and currency crises and hyperinflation and war and refugee situations um, are part of daily life. Mm -hmm. Can I see the use of Bitcoin um, to buy my morning latte um, instead of using a Visa card at Starbucks? No, but all that demonstrates is the privilege of being part of 3% of the population that has that level of banking. Well, the other 97% have much bigger needs, uh, needs that are not being served by the current banking system. So what do you need once you have that killer app? And the answer is really simple, time. All we need is time. As time goes by, the adoption, the usefulness, the ease of use, the ease of security uh, increase and spread, and we see broader and broader adoption of these technologies. And we're seeing the result of time. We're seeing an explosion of startups in the ecosystem, yes. venture capital come in, 
uh, major industry players who didn't really consider Bitcoin or blockchain as a thing now learn more about it. So they're really in a, in a large learning stage right now. Um, tell me about the skill gaps, because now everyone can understand or is beginning to understand the need of Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, but what about the supply of talent, the supply of people who understand it, developers, uh, marketers, so on and so forth. Where are we there when it comes to it? Oh, it's, it's a tiny pool of skill. Um, and that skill is very varied. There's probably a few hundred thousand people who know what Bitcoin or blockchain is beyond the very surface layer, who've used it for a year or so, who have some experience in it. There's pro probably a few ten thousands tens of thousands of people who understand the basics of how the technology works. There are single-digit thousands of people who understand the technology in depth. And there are uh, probably just hundreds of people who have deep expertise, who understand the real nuances and the subtle aspects of this technology. Now that number is constantly growing. Um, and of course, you know, in a space where being a veteran means you've been in the space for four or five years, uh, it, it's it's really you know, computer science is a young science compared to law, accounting, mm -hmm. and some of the other things we touch. Right, Bitcoin and blockchain are affecting economics and law and accounting Absolutely. professions that have hundreds, thousands of years of tradition in them. Computer science is a 60, 70 year old uh, discipline, and blockchain science. Uh, is a five-year-old yeah. discipline. It's a maybe a six-year-old discipline if you assume some of the very early uh, people involved in this. But don't confuse age with impact. Uh, and this may be a new science, but it's going to ha it's it's punching above its weight range. It's going to have a very big impact, and you're going to see a seven-year-old science change thousand-year-old professions like law hmm. in ways that are completely unanticipated. To do that. We have to train business management, administrative roles, um, sales, economics, finance, regulatory, compliance, all of these professions. There is enormous demand for people who have uh, the ability to understand and specialize in blockchain related technologies. The skills are very transferable. Mm -hmm. If you learn Bitcoin, you also know many of the other blockchains. You learn the fundamentals, whether, it, whether you're working in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, in a private ledger, or in any other space. All of these skills are transferable, which is ironic, of course, because not only are Bitcoin people training to, to be useful to the banks, but the banks pour a billion dollars into training people who can learn how to do Bitcoin. <laughs> so um, it's, it's kind of that double-edged sword. The more people they train in this technology, the more it's going to disrupt them. Um, so yes, skills are my main focus. Education is my main focus. Um, and in building this new industry, that means training up tens of thousands of people over a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that training is ever evolving. Right. Like, well, one of the interesting things with the network and the people that I work with is that it makes you question a lot of things. Bitcoin and blockchain, just being in the space, it makes you question. The, the first thing for me um, that I got into it was what is money? Yeah, what is right? money? Yeah. Absolutely. So, first learning about Bitcoin after um, kind of reading the white paper, or watching some of your videos and other videos, it just led me to that question what is money? Which, if you think about it, most people go to work for 40 hours a week for this concept of money, but most people don't even really know what it is. They have no idea what one of the oldest technologies of humankind is, how it works, how it affects their life. And Bitcoin puts contradictions in place that force you to question some of the fundamental assumptions about money um, because it doesn't provide the standard answers. And so it's easy to confuse money with the form of money we have now. Um, but that is not money. Money is a far more abstract and more fundamental technology than the current instance of what we mostly accept as money. Mm -hmm. uh, money is paper, money backed by debt, money issued by central bankers. Exactly. You know, that hasn't always been money. It won't always be money. Uh, and Bitcoin forces you to look at that contradiction and reevaluate. Um, I think there, there's mu many more uh, deep insights that come from learning this technology. And you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I said we have to train up tens of thousands of people. Perhaps that's a slightly formal way of saying it, and, and maybe we, I should back away from that a bit and say, it's not just about training. This is not going to be a top-down, let me teach you Bitcoin kind of moment. It's not going to be an academic institution thing only. 
It's not just going to be educational organizations or even certification organizations like C4 uh, who's sponsoring this conference and I'm a, a board member of. A lot of it is very informal, very grassroots. It's it's 14-year-old kids dabbling in uh, in Ethereum contracts from high school and learning how to program like I was when I was a kid and learning how to program in my early teens. Um, it's uh, people in college, it's people in other jobs who are just playing around and trying to learn these concepts. A lot of it is informal. A lot of it is experiential training, which is far more valuable than classroom training. There aren't enough classrooms to teach the people we need. A lot of this is going to be in the classroom of public action and participation and experimentation. Um, and so, you know, when I say training is a slightly formal way, sure. we need to think of it much more broadly. This is a learning space. Mm -hmm. And in this learning space, it's continuous learning. I am in this five years, I work in this space full time. I am learning full time. And every week I learn something that surprises me and that forces me to reevaluate some of my uh, assumptions and insights. And then, uh, usually soon after that, I do a talk <laughs> to tell everyone about the new insight I have in this space. It's, it's never boring. Uh, it's always exciting. Um, and if you enjoy learning, it is a wonderful space to be in because you are learning all the time. Absolutely agree. Maybe we can shift gears a little bit. So we've thrown out the ter um, term Bitcoin and blockchain, right? So an analogy that people have told me to kind of explain the differences in the concept between the two, it's like imagine blockchain being the internet and Bitcoin being like email. So an application that's built on a protocol. So Bitcoin is really just the first application that we're going to see of what the blockchain can do. Is that analogy correct? How would you kind of explain to someone just learning about the differences between Bitcoin and blockchain and what blockchain can do? I'm biased, so I'm going to flip that around and say, actually, I don't think that is correct. I think Bitcoin is the internet of money. I think Bitcoin is the internet. Blockchain is the information superhighway. Blockchain is cyberspace. Blockchain is the word that uh, people use to describe something they don't quite understand, that's nicely hyped up, that they want to put a nice headline around. Mm -hmm. If you were around in the 90s when the internet was growing around and you were listening to the conversation, people were talking about cyberspace and the information superhighway. Mm -hmm. They were trying to pick and choose the parts of the um, internet that felt like um, futuristic Jetson sci-fi. They tried to pick the parts that sounded corporate and investable and safe and comfortable to them. They weren't thinking that the information superhighway would launch a revolution in Egypt or run drones that are looking at police brutality from the crowd's perspective or that uh, the internet would be used to subvert um, powerful institutions, um, many major institutions in our life. Um, they wanted it to be about leisure and consumption and television delivered to you 24-7. And that's not what's really interesting about the internet. What's really interesting was not having corporations stream entertainment to us. What's really interesting is about subverting the role of producer and consumer, mm -hmm. about empowering individuals, about connecting the world, about shrinking the globe, about bypassing censorship and giving open access to everyone. So when they say blockchain, what they want is a nice, comfy TV version of Bitcoin. Um, and Bitcoin can't be tamed like that. Bitcoin is raw, global, open, transnational. Uh, and it is where the action is. There is no other real blockchain. Mm. Um, the only blockchains that matter are the open global blockchains. Things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, things like that that actually work and are lar large scale global experiments in network centric participatory economics. Um, and then there's a marketing buzzword that people are doing proof of concept research on. And that's what blockchain is until they make something useful with it, something that runs in the real world, something that runs on a large scale. It's nothing more than a marketing term. If someone says blockchain, they haven't given you an answer. Mm -hmm. They've forced you to ask a lot of follow-up questions. What's the consensus algorithm? Who are responsible for validating the transactions? 
what is the nature of participation? Is it open to, per to innovation? Is it open to access? Uh, is it a public ledger? Is it transparent? Does it increase accountability? Does it work across borders? How is it regulated? Blockchain doesn't answer any of those questions unless you follow up, right? right? Um, and so I think we have to be very careful because it's not entirely accidental that people are trying to muddy the waters with like hype marketing terms mm -hmm. that generate a lot of VC capital. Mm -hmm. That's not where the interesting stuff is happening. Definitely. And you speak of public blockchain, so Bitcoin. Open blockchains. Public open blockchains. Yes. Um, Bitcoin being one of them, Ethereum being another. Correct. Ethereum has been on the rise lately within, I'd say, the last year, year and a half. Um, tell me your thoughts of Ethereum. What is Ethereum? Um, why, why is it so important? What the difference between that and, and Bitcoin? Why is it an open public blockchain? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, Ethereum is another blockchain. It's an open public, open participation, open innovation blockchain. And whereas uh, the primary function of Bitcoin is to implement currency and payments, and it can do some more complex smart contract operations with a focus on keeping them relatively simple to ensure very, very robust security, very robust immutability uh, with a high energy proof of work algorithm. Ethereum is, is in a slightly different niche. It specializes in offering a much more flexible programming language uh, for those who are computer scientists, a Turing complete programming language that allows the expression of arbitrarily complex contracts, which are basically programs um, that um, are autonomous, that can own and spend money, that can call other contracts that can own and spend money, that can have users interact with them, send them payments and receive payments from them, and execute logic to decide how to organize um, financial association and transactional activities. So with these smart contracts you can build things like um, voting organizations okay. uh, that allow people to build essentially ad hoc virtual corporations. You can build um, uh, alternative currencies, tokens, reward systems, registration systems, uh, etc. Et so Ethereum is specialized more in offering this flexibility and richness of expression um, in a different way than what Bitcoin does. Uh, and in that it has some applications that you can't do with Bitcoin and of course there are some applications in Bitcoin that you can't really do with Ethereum. Um, some people call them rivals, I don't think they are. In fact, I look at them essentially like the lion and the shark, like okay. both dominant within their respective ecosystems, but they can never fight each other because one will always be out of its element mm -hmm. uh, in the other's element, right? So that um, they can each exist in a niche, uh, thrive in that niche, uh, and be very effective in that niche. But what makes a shark perfect for water makes it useless on land and vice versa, right? So what makes Ethereum flexible enough to run smart contracts makes it very difficult for it to be used as a reserve currency or robust immutable ledger um, and to offer the same levels of security and robustness that Bitcoin has and vice versa. Bitcoin is limited in the expression of contracts that it can do, uh, but the ones it can do, much more focused, much more simple, also much more secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some the thing is with, with this space is that it's so early that you can really carve your own market. There is, there is no direct competitor. Well, there can be direct competitors, but there's such an opportunity that you can really carve your own market at, right. at, at the end of the day, no. right? This, opened, this technology opened an entire ecosystem which has thousands of niches and use cases and applications. and We're going to see a lot of different systems developed, some of which will specialize very narrowly, some of which will be much more broad and generic. And they compete only in the loosest sense. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily what they're all doing is exploring the brand new ecosystem to find niches where they can be applied. Exactly. Um, being fun. useful is the primary competition right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, finding a place to be useful. And um, there are many places to be useful. Uh, it's going to take a long time until you start seeing, you know, really direct head-to-head -head competition in a specific use case. Sure, and it's it's interesting to see that um, kind of Bitcoin wouldn't be able to exist without the internet. Yes, Ethereum 
was based off of this idea of Bitcoin. Yes. And now there's this new project that has been a buzz, which is the DAO. Yes. Which wouldn't have existed without Ethereum. Correct. Because it's built off of Ethereum, right? Um, speak to me a little bit about what the DAO is, um, your opinion of it, because they have had some recent news come out lately. Um, what are your thoughts of the DAO, the decentralized autonomous organizations? The DAO is the first instance of a running large-scale decentralized organization. The idea is it is a, a, a programmable entity uh, that runs on the blockchain that has voting members who buy shares and in buying shares they create uh, essentially shareholder capital within this entity and those shares then give them voting rights uh, to create this radical experiment in investment democracy sure. uh, fund with many managing partners if you like if I can ask you a question what's the difference between that and how it corporation operates because a corporation issues shares out to its shareholders right and those shareholders vote for certain additions through a board um, what's the difference between a DAO and a typical corporation with shares the board um, really it's that uh, a corporation operates uh, based on a series of uh, organizational structures right the articles of organization that set how the board can operate how they're voted in who's elected etc etc uh, and that's similar to how smart contract works. Okay. But um, effectively, a, a traditional corporation is a representative democracy, meaning that the shareholders vote for board members, the board members um, make decisions as representatives. Uh, the DAO is a, a, effectively a direct mechanism. The shareholders vote directly for proposals that they can bring up um, almost the way you can bring petitions in some states in the in the United States, uh, citizen petitions. Uh, you gather enough signatures, you get a petition passed, and then everyone can vote, and if they vote it becomes law, and you cut out the lawmakers, you cut out the legislative function of that state. Mm -hmm. Well, the DAO did that with corporations. You put a proposal up, if it gets enough supporting signatures, then it's it's eligible for a vote, then the participants can vote pass that proposal and fund it. Uh, now, this was the first experiment. Um, unfortunately, it uncovered a, uh, a very complex bug in the code, uh, which allowed uh, one of the participants to exploit that bug and drain a lot of the initial capital from that um, contract. Right. So now we're going to see what the response of the <coughs> ecosystem will be as to how they deal with that particular problem. You know. It's really important to understand that none of this is theoretical. We're not sitting around writing papers or talking about what if we did some things to change the world. This is a space in which we're doing experimental application in real world, large scale networks of network centric and participatory systems that have never happened before on a scale that has never happened before. And guess what happens when you do experiments? Sometimes they blow up in your face. Um, if you invest in any of these things, if you get involved in any of these things, you must be prepared for the very real chance that is going to blow up in your face, right? Um, and some of these experiments have shown much more durability. Uh, you know, Bitcoin's been running for seven years. Mm -hmm. The core protocol has never been hacked. Um, we have seen bank failures effectively at the edges with exchanges, many of them famous, um, and these are part of the growing pains and lessons that are learned. You have to understand that in order to innovate you have to risk. And these are high risk but they're also high innovation systems. Um, and so yes, the DAO at the moment seems to have become a... a I, I wouldn't call it a failed experiment because we can't yet determine the outcome. But it certainly ran into some very serious problems. Uh, but it's also going to teach us some very valuable lessons. There will be more DAOs. There will be more decentralized organizations. There will be more in, uh, investment vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, the DAO itself was the largest Kickstarter funded, crowdfunded project in history. Okay. Uh, and the next DAO will be the largest crowdfunded project in history. And there will be many, many, many more to come. For reference, how much did the DAO raise as a crowdfund? I think at the top of the price, it was uh, at about $225 million in value, uh, raised over a period of about 30, 30 days. And comparing that to Ethereum, um, Ethereum, I believe, raised $20 million? 
uh, Ethereum raised 20 million at the beginning and right. reached a peak uh, valuation or market capitalization, if you like, of approximately two and a half billion dollars. Right, and so we're going to see that increase over time as more and more experiments and applications come. Out. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's wrong to look at these as investment vehicles, to look at these as stocks or. Um, opportunities to invest. A lot of people get burned when they look at these mm -hmm. in that way. Definitely. You have to look at these as technology platforms. They're technology platforms that run with real money. So and you have to be very, very careful. Um, but there's a lot to learn in this space. Yeah, and I, I like your statement of the fact that this is not theoretical. This is live. So it's this is not theoretical. The only way to learn how to use programmable money is with real money. Mm -hmm. Everything else is is irrelevant. Right. You, it doesn't matter what you think yeah. will happen. Yeah. All, what matters is what actually happens. It's like you're on a rocket ship, it's in the air, and you're repairing the rocket ship and coming up with new add-ons during the moment of. Right, that's, absolutely. That's really the space. Yes, and, and there's a lot of risk in that, but there's also a lot of value, uh, because it's the only way to learn the really important lessons, and the innovation in this space is just absolutely breathtaking yep. in its scope and acceleration. Yeah, because a, a lot of what this technology does is, uh, for example, you said a direct democracy as opposed to a representative democracy. And what that does is kind of take out the human element, the ability to um, be selfish in your decisions, being that representative there and codifying that. Well, I think it, it doesn't take out the human element. It decentralizes the human element. It actually depends on people being selfish, okay. but it depends on many, many, many people at the edges of the system be all being selfish, right. uh, and and in that way, creating this balance of economic incentives, risks, and rewards that keeps the system both stable and secure. We see that with Bitcoin mining. We see it with the consensus algorithm. We see it with the DAO too. The idea is, you, if you give enough participants, 25,000 participants, the right to vote, mm -hmm. um, that you engage the wisdom of the crowd in these proposals. Um, what it does is though it disintermediates, it removes uh, trusted third parties, it removes intermediaries, middlemen from uh, any kind of system. It removes hierarchy, it turns them into flat decentralized systems. In the end, the best way to understand these technologies is they represent decentralization which has been a fundamental force brought forth by the internet in the context of money. So we're taking the concept of decentralization from the internet and we're applying it for the very first time in history to the context of money. Uh, and decentralization is an enormously powerful um, system of thought. And money is an ancient and enormously powerful technology. And when you bring those two together, uh, a, lot, a lot of things change. So we've talked about Bitcoin, we've talked about blockchain, we've talked about Ethereum, the DAO. Um, what are some other interesting projects that are going on right now that you see that you think could be very, very impactful or just of general interest? There, there's, there's many very interesting projects. Um, to me, I think some of the applications that have most interest are uh, areas where traditional systems are failing to serve the needs of people. So anything to do with economic inclusion, remittances, the alleviation of poverty, uh, connecting people to a global economy with a minimum amount of barriers in place. Uh, those kinds of projects are interesting to me because I think they will have an enormous impact and because there's enormous need for them. The other area that I'm very interested in is the sharing economy. Okay. Uh, taking untapped resources um, that exist on, uh, on personal computers, um, the untapped resources of labor or untapped resources of productivity uh, that may exist and bringing them into a marketplace where uh, people can trade for these resources. Think uh, Uber utilizing the resource or lift of your personal vehicle to bring transportation to other people or Airbnb doing that for your uh, home space. You have a room, it's not utilized you monetize it, you give it price discovery, you connect it in a marketplace with others. Well, um, the role of currency and, uh, and uh, payment systems that we see through blockchains is really powerful in that space. Uh, you can, a lot of the things that are centralized that require a company like Airbnb and Uber mm -hmm. primarily require a company because that company has to process payments. 
Right. You take away the need to process payments by introducing a blockchain technology. You can do Uber without Uber, Airbnb without Airbnb, Lyft without Lyft, person to person directly mm. with just matching software without the need for a company that takes a 20% cut. We could really revolutionize industries that are only a few years old and could already be flipped on their head. Now think of how you could apply that to the fact that we all carry around laptops that have excess disk capacity that we don't use, um, networking capacity, CPU capacity, um, we have Wi-Fi hotspots at home okay. that are underutilized. Um, we could take these resources, measure them, make them available, monetize them, and share them so that uh, I could share Wi-Fi at my home. Uh, earn some kind of token, Wi-Fi token, um, and then take that Wi-Fi token, go on vacation, and instead of paying a hotel, you know, fourteen dollars a night for Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. I could simply piggyback on the neighbor's Wi-Fi and pay them in Wi-Fi tokens that I earned by sharing mine, mm -hmm. and I redeem on the Wi-Fi that they're sharing. I could rent out computing or graphics capabilities on my computer so that someone in my building who's playing a VR game could pull in 20 computers from his neighbors over a local high-speed network and get much higher resolution and graphics processing right. just for an hour to play a game, uh, pay with CPU uh, coin, and then um, later during the day rent out their computer when they're not using it so someone else can enjoy a VR game at higher resolution. So, you know, this concept of taking resources that are underutilized and, and sharing them, I think that's really fascinating to me. Right. What you can do with personal clouds, personal computing, right. and sharing economy. And I mean, the idea of sharing economy is generally pretty new. To be able yes. to take my asset that I have and rent it out. But kind of what you're saying is that this goes beyond the realm of physical. Because with Uber, I'm renting out a physical car. With right. Airbnb, I'm renting out my physical room. Um, for other, there's another sharing service, TaskRabbit, you're actually physically doing something. But what you're saying, this allows you to do is rent out digital, is right. to rent out your storage. On but your it also, yes, it expands the scope to both virtual and physical things, but it also removes the need and this is really critical a lot of the systems in our society that are centralized are centralized because the payment ne networks are right. centralized right. the reason I can't pay a driver directly to take me somewhere is because they can't set up the very complex operation of accepting a credit card and with something like Bitcoin they don't need to they mm -hmm. can accept it right on the spot be guaranteed that it's not forged be perfectly secure in that money once they receive it mm -hmm. and give me a ride. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, if you decentralize payments, then you also decentralize all of the companies that are centralized because of payments, right. like Uber and Airbnb. Right, and the majority of companies that are valuable play that role of payment facilitation. They're business. intermediaries, yes. Right. And so that's, that's a huge value add to the customer, but it's also going to take out many of the major players right now that facilitate these transactions between yeah. us. The internet disintermediated communications intermediaries, primarily. Okay. People who had intermediary roles in marshalling and distributing information, mm -hmm. newspapers, right. uh, retailers that were trying to do market discovery and find audiences, mm -hmm. uh, news, media entertainment. Right. All of those things got disintermediated because uh, the aggregation of information was the bottleneck mm -hmm. and that got removed. Right. But the internet did not disintermediate uh, the intermediaries of payments. And in fact, it reconcentrated them. Mm -hmm. Well, Bitcoin is the internet of money, and it's going to disintermediate the payment middleman, and and completely change and create a new wave of the internet, mm -hmm. uh, which has even further reaching implications. So maybe let's look forward here. So the the ability of what Bitcoin to do payment wise is allow financial inclusion. So right now, I think of the six billion, six point five billion people on Earth there's a certain small percentage of people that have access to banking services. Yeah. So you and I can easily buy an item on eBay, on Amazon, but let's say my family back at home in Vietnam, who operate in a cash-based society, can't jump online, can't participate in this global right. economy. Right? Absolutely. So what is the world going to look like once Bitcoin goes mainstream, once uh, you know applications are in people's phones and people can actually contribute this? What's the world gonna look like and how long will it take, do you think? 
I think it's going to take uh, a couple of decades before you see very broad adoption of these technologies. Uh, but it's not going to be equal. Uh, as Nicolas Negroponte from the MIT Media Lab once said, the future is here today, it's just distributed unevenly. Um, meaning that some places adopt faster and some places adopt slower, and the penetration of new technologies is uh, distributed unevenly across the world. You have situations where there's going to be enormous need to implement these things right away. Uh, I think we're going to see adoption of uh, digital currencies that are out of the control of governments in places where governments are failing to provide currency to people. So places that have monetary crises, Argentina, maybe Brazil, maybe Greece, um, you're going to see that. Places where you have very large expat populations that send large remittance flows, Mexico, Philippines, Vietnam. Um, Places that are cash-based societies where you have a uh, very low uh, liquidity and flexibility of capital. You know, the, the statistics are really staggering. Out of the seven and a half billion people on this planet, the World Bank estimates two and a half billion people are completely unbanked, live in cash-based societies. They only count the head of household in that two and a half billion number, and they only count completely unbanked. I would say the numbers are much bigger than that. If you were to take the underbanked, uh, those who have some access to banking facilities, but very limited, single currency, very restrictive, you're probably looking at close to four billion. Um, then if you take it the other way and you say, well, I can open a brokerage account and be trading on the Tokyo Stock Exchange tomorrow. You know, what do you call that? Privileged power banking? Um, if you take the privileged power banking, the people who have no currency controls, the ability to operate in any market, any currency, without restrictions from their government, complete freedom to do so, uh, 24 hours a day anywhere in the world. There's maybe a billion and a half people. So Bitcoin is all about the other six billion, the ones who don't have power banking. And what happens when you give all of them power banking, extreme privilege banking? You give them the power to act as a bank, not just as a bank customer, but as a bank. Uh, when installing an app on your phone turns you into a banker and gives you equal access to a world of payments. and You can do that both for the people who have limited access to the people who have absolutely no access to financial services. It changes the world. Unfortunately, we continue to see reactionary attitudes. You, know, you, you give me the example of Vietnam. Vietnam is one of a handful of countries that have banned Bitcoin completely. Um, and which is really, um, it's really a shame because I think there's enormous need and there could be enormous benefit. Mm -hmm. But the fear of new and different technology and losing control of money at a state level is so pervasive that um, they're treating it with great trepidation. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see those attitudes change. Yeah, people are going to see it more as an opportunity rather than a risk. Yeah, and you're always going to see people push borders regardless of what the people at the top say. I mean, even though they say Bitcoin is banned in Vietnam, I think they have a blockchain conference happening this month. Yeah, making it illegal in countries where um, the rule of law is not respected yeah. strongly, where corruption is endemic, where the people who make the law are not trusted by anybody else, yeah, exactly. um, may actually have the <clears throat> unintended consequence of increasing the circulation yes. of these things. We saw that in the past when the Soviet Union tried to ban the ownership of hard dollars. Mm -hmm. The first to start stuffing hard dollars into suitcases was a very Politburo that passed the law. Mm -hmm. um, and It became extremely um, common to bribe politicians, judges, mm -hmm. Uh, and military officers in hard dollars because that way you knew you were dealing right. with a completely corrupt official. If they right. were willing to take dollars <laughs> and break the law, you could trust them not to turn you in, right? Um, and in fact, the the circulation of hard dollars quadrupled over the next few years. <laughs> so banning it had the exact opposite effect. I think we're going to see the same thing yeah. um, with with digital currencies. Right. Um, maybe last question that I got for you. Uh, Bitcoin price has been on a tear lately. Yes, I think right now in Canadian dollars, it's just hovering under a thousand bucks, maybe nine hundred and fifty bucks. Um, what does that price have to do um, with kind of people's perception of Bitcoin and blockchain? And where do you think the price is going to be, uh, maybe a month from now, two months from now? 
I wish the price didn't matter. I wish people would pay attention on the value and impact of the technology. Um, the price is primarily driven by speculation. It's not driven by fundamentals. There are some fundamentals that are influencing it. The fact that Bitcoin survived, the fact that it went through a downturn and came back uh, provides strong evidence that there's more to it and it refuses to simply die. Um, and in the end, that becomes a compelling feature of a digital currency is, it, is its ability to be resilient and, and remain active. Um, I think, in addition to that, we are seeing kind of the end game of Keynesian central banking and monetary policy. We're seeing a, a fundamental global crisis in, and currency wars that have broken out. You know, right now the U.S. dollar and the yuan are in a race to the bottom for who's going to devalue their currency and debase their currency faster. Um, last. Uh, last month, we saw the yuan have another devaluation. Mm -hmm. That drove a lot of people into Bitcoin. Now, a lot of that speculation and following momentum, I think uh, some of it is also capital flight. Right. It's using Bitcoin as an exit valve together with precious metals, gold, mm -hmm. silver, etc., to get out of a currency that's being debased. Last week, the Federal Reserve in the United States refused to raise interest rates because the economy is dead again. Um, and is, is demonstrating that they are increasingly not in control, if they ever were. Right. That loss of credibility, the fact that by not raising interest rates, they're going to continue to debase the currency um, you know, and, and drive inflation up and, and reduce the value, even though it's become strong, a strong currency, uh, will force the yuan to devalue again, uh, which will then push deflation back into the US, which will force the dollar to devalue again, and this game to the bottom continues. Right. Um, and it's not just those two. I know it's the, not just those two. Twenty economics. some central banks have zero interest policies. Yeah. We are in a massive monetary crisis now. How does Bitcoin stand in there? It is beginning to look like an exit. It's beginning to look like a safety valve, and that has very serious implications. Putting a constraint on monetary policy, giving people options. So. I'm not going to say that's what's driving the price. Sure. I think it's important to note that there is an element of that, and mostly it's speculation. Sure. Um, but you know, who knows where it's going to be next month? Right. Uh, it's going to be um, you know one bitcoin, I guess, in the next five years is going to be worth approximately one thousand millibits, okay. uh, which is <laughs> <laughs> Quite a, a thousand thousandths of a bitcoin, which is a tautology. A Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. Right. Uh, when we stop talking about the exchange rate between Bitcoin and other currencies, then you know that this is really a long-term store of value. In the meantime, we're going to see wild swings. This is, this is the fifth big uh, ramp up in Bitcoin's history. It's probably going to retrench to a lower level and then bounce back again and again and again. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a roller coaster. We're talking about a, a 12 to 14 billion dollar economy that is global. Uh, and that means that it's like a little boat buffeted by the waves. You have to get used to volatility. Absolutely.